You see, Jesus promises himself to us. All his blood and sweat, everything that he did while he was on earth, the perfect life that he lived, his teachings, his testaments, the way that he loved and treated people, those are all things that are dedicated to us. And we have that high degree of intimacy with him as well, that he has promised all that he is to us and that we can share in part with his inheritance, the inheritance that comes with him living a perfect, sinless life. But we have a part to play in this as well. Because we also are supposed to promise ourselves to him. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, and we are going to be continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel. Now, the only thing you need to know to sort of understand what's going on here is that Samuel has already been anointed, and this takes place in 1 Samuel 18. So he's already been anointed, he has slain the giant, he's already soothed Saul's soul with his heart playing, and so he's basically in with the royal family now, and he's kind of well known in Israel as being sort of a national hero, and he has very close ties to Saul and his family as well. And so because of that, we go ahead and go to 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 5. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of all of Saul's servants. So this is a pretty big deal for David because he is being treated as though he is a member of the royal family. David from a little backwater town of Bethlehem, and somebody that spends pretty much all of his life just tending to his father's sheep out in the middle of nowhere, all of a sudden has become a national icon that is dining with and living with the, na the royal family in the palace there in Israel. So this is a pretty big deal for David, and he is being treated like a member of the royal family, and, and that's how the royal family themselves are also treating him like he is a actual family member. So we see that he lives there, he goes on missions, he wears their colors, he's wearing the prince's armor when he goes out to these different tasks that Saul sends him to. And remember that Saul and David were close before they were enemies. I think we forget that sometimes. We always think of Saul being the enemy of David, but they were friends at one point. Now, obviously, this isn't exactly the same kind of relationship, but it's sort of like how Lex Luthor and Clark Kent were friends before they became Lex and Superman. They were buddies. They were childhood friends. They spent a lot of time together. They really liked one another. And that's how Saul was with David for a long time. Saul treated David like another son. He treated him like Jonathan's brother. He loved him. He wanted him around to the point to where he said to his father, let me hang on to him for a little while. Uh, he wouldn't let him return to his father's home. He kept him there in the palace. That's how much affection Saul had for David, and he trusted him. He trusted him enough to send him out on missions to go and, and do that which Saul asked him to do. And so there is a very familiar, uh, familiar relationship between the two of them, one of mutual love and respect, and that did last for a while before suddenly they became enemies. Now, if you read just a few verses down, you'll see it doesn't last as long as you might think. But how long? A couple years, maybe? Was it four or five years that David was dwelling in Saul's house 
Because every indication that we get when Saul's going on the run is that he's at least an older teenager, if not a fully grown man. And yet, this elapses all in the space of just a few verses. Maybe it was a lot longer period of time than the verses let on. It doesn't really say specifically. But when he slays the giant, it talks about him being a youth. And when he's running away from Saul, it kind of alludes to the idea that David is a man by this point. And so it could have been a period of several years that he's there living in the palace, working with Saul, working with Jonathan. And that may have been quite an amount of time. They were close before they were enemies. But another thing I'd like to point out is, and I want to call attention to this because it's such an interesting piece of scripture and one that we don't really see all that often in the Old or the New Testament, is this idea of a covenant. There are only six covenants between God and man in the entire Bible. So a covenant is a really big deal. This is not a covenant between God and man. This is a covenant between Jonathan and David. So it's not as strong or not as significant as a covenant between man and God. But it is a covenant. This is something that is deeper than a promise. God makes a lot of decrees, and he makes a lot of promises. Making a covenant is rare. God doesn't do it very often. There are times where, for example, God would tell somebody that they have to do something. You know, where he would tell Jonah, you've got to get out there and go to Nineveh, or say to a prophet, you need to go out and preach this to this king, that kind of thing. And he made promises a good amount of time, too. He promised Moses that he would get to at least see the promised land. He makes promises to Abraham that he would protect him, that kind of thing. That's not the same thing as a covenant. A covenant is deep. A covenant is God entering into some kind of spiritual permanent agreement with the person with whom he is making this covenant with. And it's the same word that is used for this relationship between Jonathan and David. They have promised themselves in a spiritual way to look after one another, to protect one another, to treat each other as brothers. And this is something that we'll see throughout the course of this story that they lived throughout their lives. It was something that was meaningful to them. There are some profound covenants in the scripture, but they're always intimate. The covenant of baptism, where we come in contact with Christ's blood. The covenant of circumcision, which was a sign from God that these are my people for all male Jews. And then there's the covenant of marriage, a linking of two souls under God, man and woman. Those are all things that are talked about in the scripture as being a covenant between human beings. And so there is a high, high level of intimacy between David and Jonathan. And that is what the scripture is trying to convey by talking about the covenant they had towards one another that it is a kind of dedication and devotion to each other and to look out for one another. And that's the kind of covenant that the two of them enter into here. But remember that David keeps this covenant even after Jonathan dies. Years afterward. Years afterward, after Jonathan's gone, and nobody would even remember or think poorly of David for not keeping his covenant, even after his friend has been dead for a number of years. David goes and seeks out members of Jonathan's family to show kindness to. Remember, this is at a time where when you were a king and you overthrew the previous king, you killed everybody related to the king, everybody that was friends with the king, you just wiped everybody out because you wanted to make sure there was no challenge to your throne. David, because of his love for Jonathan, does the opposite. He goes out and he looks for people that were relatives of Jonathan's, specifically his son in one case, to show kindness to, to take care of, and to look after. Their covenant was so strong that not even death broke it. That's a friend that you want to have, somebody that is willing to dedicate themselves to you to take care of you and even take care of those just because they happened to be close to you. And this is the kind of covenant, because remember, the covenant of baptism, the covenant of being saved, is something that Christ talks about quite, quite a bit, that he enters into a covenant with us when we have a relationship with him. We have that same high degree of intimacy and love that we promise ourselves to each other. And just like any other covenant, there are conditions. 
You see, Jesus promises himself to us. All his blood and sweat, everything that he did while he was on earth, the perfect life that he lived, his teachings, his testaments, the way that he loved and treated people, those are all things that are dedicated to us. And we have that high degree of intimacy with him as well, that he has promised all that he is to us and that we can share in part with his inheritance, the inheritance that comes with him living a perfect, sinless life. But we have a part to play in this as well. Because we also are supposed to promise ourselves to him, that we dedicate our heart, our mind, our body, our soul, everything belongs to Jesus Christ, and that our actions are supposed to reflect that. And so if we want to have this level of intimacy, this degree of closeness that David and Jonathan had, we want to have that kind of covenant relationship that they had, that their soul was knit to one another. The only way to do that is to knit our soul to Jesus Christ. That we dedicate everything that we do, every word, every thought, every action, the way that we treat other people, to being more like Jesus, to do what Jesus would want us to do. And a person that is in a covenant with Jesus Christ, the outcome of that is eternal life. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media or our business partners. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2020. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.